Hello hackers, welcome back to the automated vulnerability discovery module of Pwn College. In this video, we're talking about fuzzing. Fuzzing is a dynamic analysis technique. It is um, the king of dynamic analysis techniques in some sense. Um, and as a reminder, dynamic analysis technique is this uh, is built around dynamic analysis techniques are built around this concept that you can run a program, you can see what it does, and you can make inferences based off of that. Um, fuzzing had its origins way back in the 1950s. Um, I tracked down uh, this blog post. This is as early as I could find a reference to the concept of fuzzing. Um, and back then, to test their programs, which were on um, uh, punch cards, programmed on punch cards, Developers would take previously discarded punch cards, which you know would, could be read for their data, and use them, fed them as input into the uh, programs that they were trying to test. Right, just unexpected data. That is fuzzing, um, the feeding of unexpected data to programs to see if they will misbehave. Um, fuzzing was kind of scientifically framed in the 1980s, 30 years later, rediscovered and um, described at uh, an academic uh, conference, one of the top software engineering conferences. Um, and uh, the original idea there was uh, pretty simple. Um, you run the program, you send it random stuff, and you see if it crashes. And the takeaway was, hey, lots of stuff misbehaves when sent random input. Um, in fact, what I am showing you here is a very simple fuzzer, right? You, in, in written in bash and, and with a little Python stub, you uh, send random data, this uh, cat dev you random, this is a random interface, uh, uh, a interface to the kernel where the kernel will send you random data on that file. Um, and you run whatever you uh, program you want to run and see if it crashes. And this is surprisingly effective. Um, let's take a look for a different example, actually, not for crashing. Uh, we have this compare program that takes, what is going on? We have this compare program that takes one letter and tells me that I failed. If I look at the strings, of this program, I can see that there is a success. So there there should be a triggerable success case before because it only reads one letter, the rest get print, uh, sent to my shell. All right, anyways, let's write a fuzzer to solve this. Um, here's what we do, we do while true, do cat dev, you random pipe through compare, done. And you can see it's it's it, uh, these failures that are blinking because every once in a while we get the correct output and it said success. Um, we can actually mirror that output to dev std error and then we can actually see it. Um, oh God. Okay, that was a mistake. I just sent a bunch of binary data to my terminal. Um, we won't do that, but basically, I know from the last video that this takes a star. And that was the success. So every one out of 255 times, uh, or one out of 256 times, we'll end up sending a star. It's the correct thing, and we hit success. And you can easily imagine, of course, that we can also trigger crashes this way. And this is surprisingly effective. Even these simple fuzzers, even now, if you run this on uh, an install of Umutu, you will find crashes. There were people coming to me in the baby suid module saying, hey, I uh, wrote <laughs> this um, just to, to try to uh, fuzz programs to get the flag and I found a bunch of crashes. Yes, it's shockingly effective, even this simple idea. All right, so I keep saying crashes and there was a monitor that crashes that pi, monitor for crashes that pi. Why is that? Why does our example fuzzer uh, conceptually 
look for crashes? Well, it's because crashes are attractive. Crashes are very exciting. Crashes imply memory corruption. Memory corruption implies the potential for um, achieving code execution. But uh, And crashes are very easy to see. They're very noticeable from outside of the program. You don't actually need to do crazy stuff to the program to see if it has crashed. Um, the calling process can simply call wait, and wait will return the pro uh, termination code. And then you know that the process has crashed, which is uh, super useful. Um, <clears throat> There are fuzzers that can detect other types of vulnerabilities. Uh, I talked about fuzzers that can identify race conditions in uh, the race condition module. There are fuzzers that identify algorithmic attacks, fuzzers that identify uh, information disclosure, but this is harder to do. To identify a race condition, you need to reason about the, the actual versus the um, correct state of uh, mutexes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, a pretty tricky business. So people tend to focus on memory corruption. All right. So we, we, we got the memory corruption. Um, we have the simple fuzzer. After this, um, in the early 2010s, people have moved on to generational fuzzing. So they realized, hey, if I actually just send debu random to an image processing library, it is going to very quickly say, hey, that's not a JPEG. And it won't actually execute all of that juicy code deep inside lib uh, JPEG or libpng that I actually want to get executed so that um, 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 you know I can observe bugs in it. Um, and so people created a technique called generational fuzzing. The idea is fairly straightforward. You create a file generator. For example, if I'm fuzzing object dump, um, which takes elf files as input, I will create elf files. And I have a script, generate elf file.py that just shoots out a bunch of elf files, slightly maybe uh, malformed, but, but, but uh, recognizable as elf files. <clears throat> and then I send them in to objdump. Um, an example of this, fuzz, of this type of fuzzer is peach fuzzer. Um, peach fuzz is uh, a, a file format fuzzer that takes a file format specified in XML and generates examples of it. I've used it in my research. Uh, it's pretty good stuff if you need to generate valid um, uh, uh, files and, and can't use other techniques, for example. Um, <clears throat> all right. And this brings us to the modern day, which is mutational fuzzing. Um, mutational fuzzing is a different class of fuzzers from generational fuzzing. Mutational fuzzings mutate existing inputs to try to trigger new bugs and new code, right? And uh, this is kind of now a very hacky uh, best attempt, but basically you have a loop where you pick some random input that you've tried before and you change it you flip a bit, you you know rotate it, you splice it out. Maybe you splice it with di with other input as well, and then you try that and see if the program crashes. Um, all right. So there's a couple of core questions here. One is how do we select what inputs to mutate, and two, how do we mutate these inputs? And this brings us to really the cutting edge, or 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 um, of the last half decade, let's say which is code coverage guided mutational fuzzing. Modern fuzzers have logic like this. They start with a uh, bunch of inputs, a bunch of data that they will feed into the program. This is called the seed corpus, right? These are seeds. And from these seeds, we will grow trees. And then they enter this analysis loop where they uh, will execute the program with every pending input. Initially, this is the seed corpus. They'll record what uh, instructions were executed or what coverage happened um, uh, uh, when processing these pending inputs. They will mark the inputs that increased the code coverage that executed new instructions as interesting. Say, hey, this is an interesting input that triggered new uh, instruction. Maybe if we 
tweak it a little bit more, it'll trigger even new things. Or if you tweak it a little bit more, it'll trigger a bug. So then the mutational fuzzer will mutate those inputs, the inputs that have recently increased code coverage to produce a new set of pending inputs. And the cycle continues until we find bugs. So a couple of things here. One, how do we build this seed corpus? Two, how do we identify increases in code coverage? And three, how do we mutate these inputs? All right, from here, um, this quote should be familiar now from the introduction video of this module. From here, we're going to be talking about American Fuzzy Lab, the creation of the person that uh, uh, made this quote. Uh, American Fuzzy Lab is a specific implementation of coverage guided mutational fuzzing. It was, I don't know if it was the first implementation of it, but it was definitely the first widely Ra radically famous implementation of it. Um, and it kind of changed the world of program analysis forever. Um, so first, let's talk about um, the seed corpus that you would pass to American Fuzzy Lop, to AFL. Um, um, my mind just went blank. All right. Anyways, the seed corpus, this is critical, right? So you might have heard the infinite monkey theorem. It says, all right, you can... Put a bunch of monkeys with a bunch of typewriters and have them hit them randomly and eventually you will have the works of Shakespeare. But that's going to take a very, very, very long time. In the same way, if you send a bunch of random data and you start sending, doing a bunch of random mutations off of that random data, it's going to take you a very long time, even with coverage guided feedback, to achieve something useful, right? Um, so your seed corpus helps the monkeys. Your seed corpus should be varied, right? It should represent uh, kind of a, a, a good coverage of program functionality. Um, if you are uh, fuzzing an image processing library and it supports multiple file formats, you should, excuse me, you should have multiple formats in your uh, um, seed corpus. If you are... Uh, fuzzing a um, ELF uh, processing library, you might consider putting ELFs of lots of different architectures and all of these sort of things. It should be slightly weird, right? It should be close to edge cases of the program so that the fuzzer can uh, fuzz it a little bit and uh, trigger really weird behavior. What's the easiest way to do this? The easiest way to do this is to look at um, proof of concept inputs that have triggered bugs in related code and use that as seeds. So if they're, if you're fuzzing an image processing library and you heard about a different bug in a different image processing library, go look at the image that triggers that bug in that library and put it in the library you're fuzzing, right? And the likely scenario is it's conceptually closer to an input that will trigger bugs. Bugs um, tend to cluster for a weird reason that people don't necessarily understand. Um, and your uh, corpus or the individual seeds of your corpus, not the corpus itself necessarily, but the individual seeds should be fairly small. Um, AFL, as it functions, will eventually try to mutate every bit of your inputs. Don't put useless bits, right? Every useless bit reduces the num amount of time that AFL is exploring new code. Um, so if you're fuzzing the C compiler, uh, you probably don't want comments in your C corpus, for example. Um, that, that might be a bad example, but um, it is an example. All right. Um, and also you want a, a small seed corpus in the sense that you want the smallest number of seeds that can still cover all of the functionality that you are able to trigger using all the seeds at your disposal in the program, rather than having a bunch of, uh, this is a balance between size and, and, and coverage, rather than having a bunch of tiny seeds that each trigger one functionality, it can sometimes be beneficial to have few seeds that trigger a lot of functionality um, so that you can get a lot of interaction within a single run of the binary going. Um, this is obviously a balance. Um, what you really don't want are large inputs that have a lot of this sort of uh, dead weight bytes that um, 
for which mutation is pointless, like comments. All right. Then we're moving on to measuring code coverage. So how do you measure if you have triggered extra coverage? There's uh, actually a wide number of techniques um, <clears throat> that exist for this. Uh, and, and, and philosophies and so forth, um, you might track, for example, every instruction that was executed. You might track every basic block that was executed um, and, and use that as coverage. What American Fuzzy Lob does is rely on this input that it's not necessarily the code you trigger that matters, it's how you traverse that code, right? You might have the same function and if you go through basic blocks in a given order, it might have a different functionality than if you go through the same basic blocks in a different order. So AFL measures control flow transitions, pairs of basic blocks connected by jumps. And that's how it measures code coverage. Um, and then finally, how do you mutate code? Um, AFL mutates uh, using several different mutators. Um, one mutator goes through and uh, flips L bits at a time and walks the input uh, file with S bit increments. Um, that's one, uh, that's its, its first mutator, its second mutator, it actually does uh, numerical computation again on increments of the file. Then it uh, swaps parts of the file with interesting values, so um, uh, values that are, you know, right on the edge of a bit boundary that might trigger off by one errors or frequently trigger off by one errors, these sort of things. Um, it um, can inject user supplied dictionary terms. If you're fuzzing uh, an XML file, then it's uh, useful to put a dictionary with some XML entities and so forth. Um, uh, that, 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 in this step, AFL will actually put into your, uh, uh, mutate into your inputs. Um, it'll do various random tweaks. And then a very interesting one, it'll splice multiple inputs together, right? So this, these mutated uh, mutation, um, mutators, sorry. These mutators basically uh, in the combination with that loop, with the fitness metric of uh, how much code AFL has, uh, a given input has triggered, this turns mutational fuzzing into a genetic algorithm. Uh, if you have taken genetic, if you have taken an algorithmic course that covers genetic algorithms, genetic algorithms analyze a solution, determine its fitness function, and then mutate it and breed it with other fit solutions. AFL does the same thing with inputs. Um, all right, I mentioned several times fuzzing is key king and that AFL specifically is king. Fuzzing is undeniably the best program analysis technique that we have. It finds thousands of bugs every year and you can see the impact just on this graph. The year, so AFL was released uh, initially in November of 2013, right away, there was a massive jump in the bugs that were discovered the next year. And then this has kept going as research in automated bug finding uh, reached practical stage. I want to show you um, AFL's README actually. This is the, the uh, homepage of the project. This is actually a picture of AFL I'll, I'll, um, in the live q and I'll uh, go through how to use it and, and poke around it in different ways. Um, there's a sales pitch and then there's this. Each of these links is a bug found by AFL. And at some point, I, I'm pretty sure they, they just gave up keeping track. And that's just AFL. Then there have been fuzzers, countless fuzzers, inspired by AFL and pushing forward um, past AFL, um, there are too many fuzzers to keep track of. This is a radically active area of research, um, including my research lab, uh, along with my colleagues at, at Arizona State University. We are 
pushing the um, kind of state of fuzzing forward along with other program analysis techniques. Again, if you're interested in doing academic research, um, whether or not it's at ASU, uh, shoot me a line and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, especially if you've made it this far in Pone College. Um, so uh, cutting edge fuzzers, there are just too many to keep track of. Um, I'll instead point out some really cool resources. Um, there's a project called OSS Fuzz. Basically, uh, Google and, and contributors to OSS Fuzz have harnessed uh, a lot of, uh, of um, open source software and uh, configured it to be runnable easily and fuzzable easily um, and analyzable. Um, and then Google actually goes through and continuously fuzzes um, these projects. And then, of course, reports the bugs. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to even say how many bugs were found, but it is, sorry, first shot. It is countless numbers. Um, there is a really cool project also from Google called SysCaller. It is a system call fuzzer for Linux. So it fuzzes from user space up into the Linux kernel to find kernel bugs. I've used it personally in my research. It is uh, quite awesome. Um, there is a, uh, another kind of family of fuzzers, uh, or a, another lineage, um, based on LLVM, the, the compiler infrastructure, um, now mostly developed by Apple or, and, and contributors. Um, libfuzzer requires source code. It, it, it's a integrated fuzzing library that's, that's, uh, integrated into Clang and, and LLVM, and actually OSS Fuzz uses uh, LibFuzzer as well. Um, and it's a, a great way to fuzz your uh, software during development. And then there is, um, or, and, and to integrate into your test cases for your applications. And then there's AFL++, um, the original uh, developer of AFL um, takes time between updates. Um, and so the community created AFL++ with some community um, supported additions. Um, there's also this great list, actually there's several lists, but here's one of them where you can uh, get tons of fuzzing resources, books, links to papers, a lot of really cool stuff. Again, if this sort of stuff interests you, drop me a line um, and we'll talk about research. See you in the next video.